John Fuang once said, there's one thing you have to believe in when you sit down to meditate, and that's in your actions. On the one hand, it may seem strange that you would have to believe in your actions, because after all, you see yourself doing things all day long. But there's more to it than that. You have to believe in the fact that you're actually choosing to do something. It's not some outside force acting through you or some fate forcing you to do things. And you have to believe that your actions have results, and they're determined by the quality of your mind. Now those aren't things you can simply see, because after all, it couldn't possibly be true that there's some other force that you don't know anything about that's forcing you to act, and you just think you're making choices, and you think that your actions are having results. You're not really sure that the quality of your intention is going to determine those results, because you see a lot of people acting out of greed, hatred, and delusion, and they seem to be pretty happy, in the short term at least. So it is a matter of belief, and the Buddhist proof simply is that if you really want to put an end to suffering through your own efforts, this is what you have to believe. You have to take this as your working hypothesis. This is one of the reasons why Buddhists aren't out on the street corners trying to convert people, because for someone to take up the path requires that that person want to be responsible. A lot of people don't want to be responsible. They'd rather hand things over to some outside force to say either that they're innately bad and they require an outside force to come in and save them, or that they're innately good and there's nothing really they have to do, just relax and allow their innate goodness to act through them. Both ways of thinking are abandoning responsibility. But to take up the Buddhist path, you have to want to be responsible. After all, he said, all things are rooted in desire. And he goes on to say in another place that all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness. Heedfulness is what makes you want to take on responsibility. You see that your actions do matter and they can lead to a lot of suffering or they can lead to a lot of happiness. So you want to be very careful about what you do and say and think. And this is something you have to want to do for it to happen. So it's good to stop and think here. What are your reasons for wanting to be heedful? And to realize it's your desire for happiness. That's what the Buddha is assuming when he teaches. He's teaching for people who want to find true happiness. There's got to be that desire there, otherwise it's not going to happen. You run into so many teachings nowadays that meditation is simply a matter of being or knowing, and you're not supposed to do any doing. And that seems to assume that all you have to do is just relax and everything is going to go okay, i.e. you've got some innate good nature or the universe just kind of works out if you don't interfere. But things don't work that way. There's the part of the mind that has to be alert, but there's also the part of the mind that has to be ardent. You have to want to do things skillfully, and you have to put in the effort to figure out, well, what is skillful in any situation? And be willing to learn from your mistakes. Heedfulness is not easy. It requires that you be very careful and very alert and very discerning in how you judge your actions and the results. This is why motivating yourself in the practice is a constant, constant requirement. You have to keep reminding yourself why you're doing this. And when you find your energy flagging, what can you do to get your energy back up? Because whether you're heedful or not, you're constantly 
making choices, you're constantly acting. And each time you let an opportunity for a skillful action go past, you've wasted time. You have to ask yourself, if you don't do the practice now, if you don't pay careful attention to this choice right now, when are you going to start being careful? And if you keep on letting it slide this way, aren't you building up some habits that are going to be hard to overcome down the line? And if you don't do it, who's going to do it for you? So remind yourself of why you want to be heedful. It really does make a difference. That's probably the primary motivating factor. It breaks out into other, other motivations. There's the motivation of compassion. When you realize that when you train the mind, you really are creating better circumstances for yourself and people around you. It's a gift. There's that one passage where the Buddha said, you started practicing to find an end to suffering. If you give up on the practice, do you really love yourself? It doesn't say it in so many words, but that's the basic thrust of that particular passage. This type of motivation is especially easy when, or at least it's made easier, when you've learned how to breathe in a way that really does feel refreshing, that the meditation is not just something that you're fighting with all the time. But you learn how to create a sense of well-being right here, right now. And you can remind yourself, when you meditate, you feel a lot more nourished. It's a good time to heal all the wounds in the mind. And so heedfulness is not just a harsh taskmaster. There's compassion in the motivation of heedfulness as well. Because otherwise you can think about all the, all the tears. You know, there's that famous image of the t water in the oceans as being less than the tears you've shed in the many, many lifetimes through the many cycles of the universe. And do you want to shed that many more tears before you're ready to practice? It's for your own well-being and for the well-being of people around you that you want to be careful about what you're doing right here, right now. A while back I was listening to a Dharma teacher say that she'd suddenly realized when she sat down to meditate she really ought to have some idea of what she was doing. In other words, there was, had to be a purpose in the meditation, a plan. And again, that comes from a school of thought, at least she had been coming from a school of thought where meditation was supposed to be just being open to whatever comes and learning to be accepting of whatever comes. That's not heedfulness at all. That's a very heedless kind of meditation, a very irresponsible kind of meditation. But at least she now discovered that Maybe it would be a good thing to decide you want to stay with your breath during the meditation than to keep coming back to the breath, both because it develops your powers of mindfulness and alertness and also because it's a mature way of showing goodwill for yourself, an easy goodwill of saying, well, whatever comes up is okay, and you teach yourself to be, I'm okay, you're okay, everything is okay. But it's not okay. There's a lot more that can be done. There's a lot better way that you can direct your life. You can work with the breath. It does give rise to a greater sense of well-being. You can work with the mind that gives a greater sense of well-being, learning how to stay focused and solid in the midst of all the all the changes that come your way. Because after all, we do live in a middle level of being. 
The Buddha talks about levels of being that are exclusively painful, those that are exclusively pleasant, and then those that are a mixture of pleasant and painful. We're one of the mixture. And do you want your mind to keep going up and down in line with the mixture? Or do you want to anesthetize it and just say, well, whatever comes up, that's okay? Or do you want to really develop a sense of well-being inside so that your needs are met without having to depend on the world outside? So it really is okay. Not because you're just telling yourself to lower your standards. You actually raise your standards as you practice as to what qualifies as real happiness. And then you have a practice that allows you to meet those standards. That's what heedfulness is all about, is realizing the, the range of results that can come from your actions, taking consideration of the, the story of the Buddha, which says that through your own actions you can attain, can attain absolute unconditioned happiness. That's the possibility that's open to you. But how would you live? if you took that possibility seriously. Fortunately, you don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel. The path is here, and it's humanly possible. The Buddha didn't, didn't attain awakening through any special ability that he had that nobody else had. These are abilities we can all work on, we can all develop. So this is what it means to believe in your actions. This is why everything the Buddha taught centers on actions. The Four Noble Truths seem to be all about suffering and stress, however you want to translate dukkha. But the pattern is that these things come from your actions, and the end of suffering and stress also comes from your actions. This is why the Buddha talks about action so much. He calls his teaching, Gamawadi, a teaching about action. That's why right view grows immediately into right resolve, because there are skillful and unskillful actions. You want to abandon unskillful ones and replace them with skillful ones. And the whole rest of the path grows from that. And so we want to find out is, okay, what are the, what's the payoff when you really believe in your actions? Well, it's not something, anything you're going to know just by looking or thinking. It's something you learn by doing. Mundane right view grows into transcendent right view. Through the Buddha's description of generosity and virtue and the rewards. And, but then he goes on to talk about the fact that those actions, which we've all experienced, we've all engaged in, lead to rewards that are good but have their drawbacks. The purpose of that is to inspire you to be ready to listen to the Four Noble Truths. Think about what would it be to put an end to the causes of suffering totally. As for mundane right resolve, that grows into transcendent right resolve by actually putting into practice the principles. Learning how to divide your thoughts into skillful and unskillful in terms of the actions they lead to. And then finally realize that even skillful thoughts can wear out the mind. That brings the mind to right concentration, which is transcendent right resolve. So everything is about action. Even the talking is, in, in itself is a type of action, and it's meant to lead to more actions. All that's asked is that you believe in your actions. And from that everything else grows.